So um, what we wanted to do was talk about this idea of communication. And um, clearly the way we all communicate has changed quite dramatically um, since March. And, and I don't know about you guys, but I seem to be spending an awful lot of time on teams communicating, um, uh, uh, not just presenting like this, but having meetings to discuss and exchange information and ideas as well. Um, and I guess that sort of highlights that there's two, two sides to communication. There's the, the people side, the human side, where we need information to be able to carry out our functions and our roles, um, but also we need access to technology to support us carrying out those functions and roles as well. And Teams does quite a good job of that for certain things, certainly for presenting like this. It's, a, it's quite a good tool. Um, and, and, and other things that I do, it can be quite good for sharing information as well. Um, but it's not always the best tool for every job. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we communicate in the construction industry, the different phases of the construction life cycle and how we communicate. And um, then Martin's going to discuss a little bit about um, some tools to support that communication and you know, complement the way that that is done in industry as well. My apologies, that's just a train going past. Um, so with, with any construction project, there tends to be this element of data and information communication. And, and um, I, I'm assuming many of you are BIM authors in this group um, here today. And you will be tasked with um, either creating the data that goes in a BIM object or somehow managing or coordinating that data at some point in, in the sort of construction life cycle. The thing is, what I've found in my research and what we found with uh, the research we've done with XBIM is that not everybody quite understands what they can ask for. So clients often don't understand what data they can have and, and how the data can be of use to them because they're just not quite sure what it is yet. And from a sort of contractor and designer perspective, often they're not sure about what data they've got to provide to a client. And even if you've got um, your sort of guidelines or, or your agreements set out in contracts and you know documents like uh, employer information requirements, there still ends up being a lot of unknowns about what data is created, generated, and exchanged between partners or, or collaborators um, or organisations on a project. So I guess the most important thing is that any data that's generated or created must serve a purpose. And that purpose must serve a purpose by the person that's going to use or consume that data. Now, that might be a client or a contractor um, on a project. So if they're requesting data that they're not going to use for some reason, then I would be questioning why they're asking for that data, because it's kind of a little bit redundant. If you don't have a purpose and a need and somebody using that data, then you just end up creating mountains of data that just gets dumped in some sort of repository somewhere, whether it's a CDE or, or some other file share, and, and it just doesn't get used. It can be unwieldy, um, it can be overwhelming, it can be unusable, it can store, you know, take up lots of space as well. So really, whenever you're creating data, you've got to think about what's the purpose, how is it going to be used, and what am I going to share? So again, if you're creating data that's not going to be shared and used or consumed by somebody else, just don't bother making it. There's no, no need to make it unless it's going to be used. Don't, don't specify it or don't let people specify data that are going to be not used. So as an author, we have got authors here today, um, I, what I would be questioning, certainly when you're talking to clients, people who are requesting that data, you want me to build this, this model, I'm going to put these objects within this model, but how are you going to use this data? What are you going to use it for? And 
once you've got an understanding of how and why they need that data, you can get a better handle on exactly what data needs to go into that object. And yes, there are sort of guidelines like the MBS toolkit and, and various other standards like the BIM uh, forum that say what data should be delivered at each stage. And that's just a guideline. It's not always, um, you know, not all organisations need all of the data that's specified at every stage. And sometimes they need uh, less and sometimes they need more. So think about who's going to use that data. What are they going to do with it? When do they need it on the journey? So if they don't need it up front, don't, you know, if you don't need to spend time up front developing that data, don't develop it until the point when it's required. And also, how are you going to share that data? And I think that's one of the biggest questions because often we see people develop their BIM objects in their sort of authoring tools, and then they hand it over to a contractor or a client who maybe isn't familiar with those tools and can't do anything with the data. So then we end up in a situation where we've got spreadsheets and, and drawings and, and various bits of data in different formats that's not necessarily reusable in, 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 um, in, in the, the recipient or the consumer's um, tools that they use. For some reason, I can't move to the next slide. Yes. OK, so within sort of construction, there are an awful lot of C's. Actually, there's more than four C's, but I'm going to talk about four sort of common C's that occur in, in construction. At the very bottom here, we've got this idea of communication, and we've already talked about communication. We have to send information around and share information on a construction project. Sometimes we hope it's been received. We definitely hope it's been understood. If we're lucky, we might get a reply. If we're really lucky, that reply will say, great, I've got everything I need, just how I want it. Thanks for that, you've met all your requirements. But often there's a bit of fuzziness in between where people try to figure out what is it that they've got? Can they reuse it? And what are they going to reuse it for? So quite often in the communication process, there's this idea of just chucking some information over and hoping that you've got it right. And I know that maybe sounds a bit um, like a sweeping statement, but we did interview quite a lot of organisations and there was a hesitancy in understanding what data clients wanted. And some organisations strip all the data out of models before they send it over. Uh, and, and then they wait until they get asked for very specific bits of data. And some organisations just send over everything and just, you know, then they're not bothered. They're just, there you are, there's your data, off you go. Um, so so there's a, some sort of fuzziness around communication still and, and how do we get the right data to the right people at the right time. And, and ultimately, when you're working on a construction project, you've got lots of different organisations producing information and data, and that's got to be coordinated in some way. So you if you're lucky, again, you might have somebody who's coordinating all that information. And if uh, and if they're good at their job, um, then that, that takes the, the sort of onus off you to make sure that all of the documents and files and, and models all integrate and work how they should be. And equally for coordination, you should have some sort of validation and verification process as well. So a community and data across the teams, not just within your own internal team, and somebody's coordinating that data and making sure it's meant to be how it's meant to be. And within a construction project, you've got all your different organisations with their independent goals that they're working towards. So it could be design goals, it could be construction goals, it could be planning goals, for example. And, and you generally have a consensus, I'd like to hope, that even though you're going, you're aiming towards your own goals, you're working together as a as a well-oiled machine, as it were, trying not to um, sabotage anything that any other organisation is doing. And I, I think the best example I've seen of this has been the Hinkley Point C project. Um, I would definitely recommend having a look what they are doing um, around collaboration, coordination, um, They've, they've got some fantastic um, processes in place there, uh, and it's a really good project there. 
So lastly, this idea of collaborating. So this is where you're working towards um, a shared goal. So you've got your independent goals, but clearly we're all working towards a shared goal, which is to achieve the client requirements of whatever the, the construction requirements are, whether it's a new build, a retrofit, or whatever that is. And with that comes shared risk, shared design creation, um, and and again, there's some fuzziness there about responsibilities of data and how it's communicated and where it's communicated. And I think what we did find with our research is that it takes a lot of time making sure that information and data is right. So there's a lot of to and fro, especially with email communication on understanding the data and getting it right. So all of this happens as an iterative process. You're constantly communicating with each other, having conversations about data and information at each of the different stages of the development life cycle. And with that communication, there comes a lot of conundrums. So often organisations want to create really rich 3D data rich models. Um, but don't necessarily have the time to make sure that the data is correct and um, to share it. Some people have said they really want to use BIM libraries, but they don't understand all the data within them. So there's a lot of time spent checking that data before sharing it and pushing it out to other partners. And some people want to really model in 3D, but they haven't got time to model all the components in 3D. So they fall back to models and analysis for sharing. So we're still finding these, these things happening um, in the day to day. And when we talk about sharing, all all of that information needs to be shared in, in, a, in an agreed sort of portal, if you like, away. And I remember at the very beginning of my sort of BIM journey, as it were, this, the, the idea of a common data environment was this utopian vision of a central repository where the, the data and information of a, a building was, was stored um, forever and shared with whoever needed it at the right time. And in reality, actually, it's not like that. You will have, you might have a main contractor with a central common data environment where all of the key documents are stored and shared, and, and not just documents, rather model data, any information associated with a uh, 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 project. Um, but then you might have your separate independent organisations who also have their own repositories for storing and sharing information internally and externally as well. So it's almost like you've got an ecosystem of common data environments. And I think um, certainly Martin's going to talk a little bit about some of the technology and how that works early on. When you're setting up a common data environment and selecting it and trying to understand how a common data environment is used, there are several drivers for, for sort of helping you um, define what it is and set up a strategy for using a common data environment. And uh, you can see this sort of well-known image on the right here of the information delivery uh, cycle. And each stage in that cycle, information is required to be um, collected, stored, and shared somewhere. So at the very start of the project, you will develop these employers' information requirements that set out what they want, when they want it, who's responsible for delivering it and that will get stored on a CDE somewhere. And then once somebody's been appointed to the job, they'll um, set out a BIM execution plan, or, or maybe they'll set out a BIM execution plan before they're appointed to prove what their capabilities are and how they would deliver that job as well. So that's post, pre and post um, appointment there. And then as the project progresses, a master information delivery plan will be created and stored and shared on a CDE and so on and so forth with your task information delivery plan and finally your asset information model and handover. And I think for, from my experience, it tends to be more at the handover and operational stage. So what I find is that often clients are given, or an employer in this case, is given an asset information model, but they don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily necessarily fit in with their systems and how they were so there's kind of a bit of right I've got all this stuff now okay what do I do with it um, um, so there, there's a real sort of need to have a, a well-defined way of sharing 
and communicate your data. And I'm not going to read through this slide, but it simply spells out the sort of things that you need to consider on your journey throughout that construction life cycle. Um, there are an awful lot of acronyms in the construction industry, but they're all very important and very valid, and each one serves a purpose at a different point in time. And each one serves a purpose for communicating across a um, construction project as well. So I'm going to hand over to Martin now, who's going to talk a little bit more about the technology side of communication and how that can happen. So I'll um, I'll just stop sharing now and hand over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. Right, uh, do you see my presentation? I think you should do. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, right. So we've talked about uh, the process of collecting data and uh, how community environments play important role in there. And uh, first of all, how we all need to communicate. So I'll try uh, to talk a little bit about that F more from perspective of computers, because on the previous slide uh, I had a title uh, computer aided communication, because like we used to have computer edit uh, design or drawing, um, we also want computers to help us uh, with communication. That's why we have them, so they can help you help us, and they want to do. Uh, when we used CAT systems of any kind, um, we are actually not giving computers very much. We are giving them lines and hatching styles, uh, and computers didn't really know what it is, so they couldn't really help us. It didn't make big difference to them whether we are drawing a blooming daffodil or, or a high-rise building. It was just loads of lines. That has changed uh, when we started to use BIM, because BIM uh, is around structured data. It is uh, the computer knows what is the wall, it knows what's the door, and now computers can help us with many things because they know what the wall is, and they know that the door and window is in the wall. Uh, inside of the opening, they can move it together, they can do uh, clash detection. Everybody likes that, but that is only possible because uh, computers know what is the wall, what is the pipe, and uh, that they shouldn't clash under, under certain circumstances. And now when we have our design, we have the great model of the building, we would like to talk to each other, but whoops, that's a bit, no, that, no, it's not that easy now, uh, and we want to use our computers as much as we can. So what most of the people do, uh, is that they take their great model, their great design, and they export into drawings, they export PDFs, they export uh, other drawings, other documents. Sometimes people share uh, models, and we usually share it using uh, various kinds of file shares, and we often use emails because uh, that is still uh, the common way of communication, it often goes through uh, quality assurance processes in companies where every email is locked, for example. Uh, but uh, all these drawings, etc., are too big usually, so uh, we just link them and we are trying to capture the context of the communication uh, in that email, hoping that everything is uh, of the same version, etc. But um, when computers get that, uh, they go, well, What's that? What is it for? I can't help them anymore because I, I can just see lines and documents uh, again. So there's little help they can provide us when we don't keep the data structured. And if we want them to help uh, to help us with communication, once we already have created all these great models, uh, we need to help them. We need to keep that the data structured because when we do, then they know it is the communication about the building. And again, they can, on the other side, provide us more added value, more added service. They can help us uh, to understand what actually is subject of that communication, what is in there, how things relate together. And we will have a look at uh, our way to solve this uh, uh, shortly in, in a demo. Then when, we, when it comes to common data environments, it's a container. Even conversation or communication in general 
uh, is a container because in common data environment land, everything is a container. That's how it's defined in ISO 19650. And that's uh, how most of the so-called CD providers uh, implement their systems because so everything is a container. It's, is, it, is it a file? Is it a model? Is it a database? Everything is simply a container. But we believe that communication and models, when they are structured data, they does have a lot more than just be a container. So we'll show you our way of uh, relating to CDs and, and uh, living uh, in this framework and still keeping the data structured, the communication structures, and hopefully a lot more useful. At the same time, as Kay mentioned, uh, it's uh, not that easy uh, or doesn't have to be uh, that strict because CDE on one side might be a single piece of technology, but most of the time uh, it might be several pieces of technologies. Uh, often you would have several CDs on project and even for the CD itself, uh, it might not be a single piece of technology. Effectively, you should uh, you should collect your requirements to see what you actually want and need from the CDE. And based on that, you might configure or set up your CD uh, in many ways. And one of them is that you might use, for example, uh, tools which we provide uh, for model sharing and communication. Uh, and we can easily connect it uh, with files uh, somewhere else. You can even keep it as a uh, as a container in these CDs uh, if that is what you actually need or want. So that's uh, my presentation and I'll jump jump in the uh, I'll jump in the presentation. So what do I need to do? Um, Um, so we built based on our technologies, we built uh, XBIM Flex Comps application, which is cloud application. It's all based on open standards. Uh, it's using uh, things like IFC, BCF, COBE, etc. Uh, internally, uh, but we realized that uh, Revit is quite widely used uh, for authoring of BIM models and that there is quite a lot of information being lost at that certain point where people export their drawings, export their model, etc. And uh, things are not well connected anymore from that point. And it is a shame because that is that break point where the information is losing air. Uh, it's, it's not um, useful anymore. So we developed a plugin for Revit, which talks to our XBM Flex Comps application and kind of fill it in uh, with data. Uh, those who work with Roid will recognize this. Uh, and we have our plugin here, where uh, well, there are some guidelines, etc. Uh, your project details, um, location of the building, uh, address, uh, and some metadata about your project. Uh, you can create template for a conversation. So uh, for various kinds of conversation, you can have uh, different setups uh, and you can drive 3D content uh, of your communication. This is again important. Uh, you can see there is a section box on this drawing. And if I just selected half of the building or just one space, that would be the whole content of, uh, uh, of the message. So what I'll show you later on uh, would only contain data for that one thing. So say you only selected one space and there was chair in there, there wouldn't be any more chairs than just the one in the space you selected. You can select normal things like your sheets, which you already created to communicate uh, various aspects of your design. And uh, important aspect is schedules, because that is essentially data. And as Kay said before, some companies choose to export everything in there. So they just publish all data in their model. They often don't even know what kind of data is in there. And they just hope that the person on the other side will pick up what they want or need, which is mostly not the case. Uh, other companies take exactly opposite approach and they wipe out everything and they just 
share geometry when they are required to, uh, and they don't share any data. What we are trying to do here is to actually help people uh, to get a fine grain control about what they share. So when you choose to publish data about sensors, room schedule and furniture, furniture schedule, and these are the only data which will be published, nothing more and nothing less. So again, it gives you very good control over what you actually share. They can select other 3D views, plans, um, sections and other things. When you're ready, just press one button. And that will create message which you can then uh, use. Uh, I'm not going to wait for this because while we uh, do everything we can, we can't speed up the road itself. So I will cheat a little bit here uh, and go to conversation how it looks like when it's uploaded to uh, our server. So this is our application uh, where it gets online after all these things are exported. And you can see these things. So you selected some main view, which is there. Um, you selected certain drawings. Uh, as you can see, it's all interactive and you can see where it is in the building. Uh, and this is what you see. And when you send it to somebody else, this is what uh, they will get access to. If you want to see just you know, extra uh, part of the building, or as I said, if you selected this, for example, as your main 3D view, this would be all uh, would be publishing. Uh, you, you can take other snapshots. Say you wanted just to say something about this sensor here. Um, you can add other documents, uh, maybe either just link, uh, but more interesting might be that you can, for example, take a Dropbox folder. Ah, this is uh, Rabbit opening the window. Okay. So I take this one. So you can link things from Dropbox, OneDrive, SharePoint, and for other uh, other external providers, and it becomes a uh, essential part of this uh, message. Um, you can write your message in here. I'll select. participant and everything is set up. You can see that, that it picked up the position which was before set up in Revit. Uh, and when everything is ready, I can send it. At this point, it's not a coincidence that this looks a lot like email because most of the people use email, understand email. And uh, when you send it, you get a copy of that email and the person on the other side also uh, gets email which contains all these previews just as thumbnails, I'd say. So they know what that message is about, uh, but they don't get all these links where you don't know what it is. Uh, you, they don't get huge emails. They just got, got, get light white email where they know what it's about uh, and they can go online and have this exact same uh, interface to see where things are in the building uh, and to interact with it and give you response. So every, all drawings are kept in the context of the building. Uh, all data is kept in context of the building. So we have uh, sensors here. I think it a second. Yeah. You can select it. And if we show the whole building, we'll see it somewhere. Go there. Yeah. So it's all, as you see, uh, it's not uh, detached. It is all in context. Your data stays there. You can download it uh, as Excel spreadsheet if you want. Uh, it's still connected to the to 3D model. 
uh, and it is all related to your 3D views. So you can, as I showed before, you can uh, link external things from external CDs or external file shares uh, to this message. Uh, you see, well, you know, we know it's a Dropbox. Uh, you can go there if you want to see what it is. And you can also uh, create uh, the, the link uh, going on the other side to make this uh, essentially objectified uh, conversation. So if if the requirement is that your CDE or your file share has to contain everything, and as I said, conversation is a container as well from the CDE point of view, you can just save this. You can save it locally. You can uh, save it to your. Uh, you may save it to your. Uh, CD, whether you have it synced or not, um, they're ready. Uh, and that's obviously uh, now synced to online uh, st storage as well. And when you access it, when you double cl double click that link or anybody uh, who clicks that, well, again, get here. You can attach other metadata to it uh, if you want to or if you need to. Uh, and it all stays connected, so you can combine uh, you can combine CD or file storages with uh, services like this, where you actually keep your data structure in context, you keep your 3D model in context, and you keep your views and drawings in context. So there is much higher chance that the communication will actually be successful, that the person on the other side will understand what you are saying or what you are asking and will give you the right uh, kind of answer. Right. Um, I'm going to uh, head it over back to you, uh, Linda. Can you? Yeah, that's fine. Good. If you un unshare your screen and I'll share yep. mine again. OK, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you see the presentation? Yep. Cool. And um, so really just um, to tie together what Kay and Martin have been saying, um, we're hoping that the challenges that you find with the work that you do are things that the Flexcom's online product are resolving. Um, and we know that there are issues particularly with um for example sending 2d drawings it's not everyone understands them knows how to read them knows what they mean in the context of the whole building or in relation to what you're asking about um but obviously they're essential and they still need to be done um 3d is easier to understand but often much harder to share and that's something that you can do using flexcoms um you can't have all the information in the 3D, so the, comp the drawings need to complement them, the schedules complement them. Um, and the reality is that both are more useful when they're working together as an integrated package of information. So what we hope is that with Flexcoms, we've given you a solution and we'd love you to try this and, and give us some feedback. Um, we're hoping that it allows anyone to work with BIM data, whether they're a specialist or not. Um, People can visualize their 3D buildings and data just using a browser. Um, it means that they can people can see the drawings and the documents, the schedules and so on against um, alongside the model. So in the context of the 3D, um, you control what data you're sharing um, from your model. Um, it means that your inbox, although still your email inbox is still important and still useful, everything's being stored in Flexcoms as well. So you keep a you keep a track of the conversations that you're having with other parties, and and you can see if decisions were made and who said what, and when, and all about the BIM data that you've chosen to share. And you can access your Flexcoms messages from any device as well. Um, there's no software or hardware to deploy um, and it's quick to exchange that BIM data. So it's different really to what you're doing, I imagine, at the moment where you're exporting lots of information or converting it to PDF, having to bring it into a package and attach it to emails, choose who you're sending it to, upload to CDEs and so on. So 
you can use flex comms now if you want to um, at no charge for personal use and um, and we've on this presentation i've incorporated the um, hyperlinks to the demos that you can have a look at the download for the revit add-in so that you can have a, have a go yourselves and um, if you're not using revit and you're using other bim authoring tools but you'd still like to use flex comms <clears throat> then that's something we're hoping to do in the future and we'd like to know which authoring tools you're using. So please do go and um, click on that link and, and tell us which other authoring tools you're using. Um, and if you want to register for a Flexcoms account, you can do, um, and that link will be on there too. Um, and if you want to um, contact us, ask us questions, um, I'll check in a minute to see if there are any questions in the chat um, and equally I'll open it up so that you can ask if you'd like to and Martin and Kay are still on. Um, but if if you want, these are all our email addresses, you're very welcome to email us and Steve will, will be quite happy to have conversations with you too. Um, and you can see on there the links to the different um, Twitter and website and so on. Um, so I'll just 